time, and it is my pleasure to introduce you um, our next speaker and the person this afternoon, um, Professor Hans Sassen, who is Professor of Comparative Literature at the University of Chicago since 2011, where he teaches in the departments of Comparative Literature and East Asian Languages and Civilizations, as well as in the Committee on Social Thought. His teaching and research interests include classical Chinese poetry and commentary, literary theory, the comparative study of oral traditions, problems of translation, and the ethics of medical care in resource poor settings. His interest in understanding any culture finds a method in comparison, comparison with other times, places, belief systems, political orders, and forms of communication. From these interests emerge his work, um, that's come from Sinology to Comparative Studies. And I would just mention a few. The Problem of a Chinese Aesthetic, published by Stanford. Great Walls of Discords and Other Adventures in Cultural China, published in 2001 by Harvard University Asia Center. Chinese Women Poets, an anthology of poetry and criticism from ancient times to 1911. Uh, Chinese Walls in Time and Space, published in 2009. And further works uh, include, for example, Comparative Literature in an Era of Globalization, published in 2006, and focusing on the history and challenges of comparative literature as a discipline, and a more recent publication, 2019, Are We Comparing Yet?, published by Bielefeld University Press. Professor Sonsi has also been interested in problems of language, as we shall see in today's paper, representation and translation. Together with Perry Meisel, he published a new edition of the Wade Baskin translation of Saussure's course in general linguistics in 2011. And another work by him, 2017, Translation as Citation, published by Oxford University Press, in which he deals with the concept of a sponsor text acting as a model for translation, often remaining unmentioned by the translator himself and usually unknown to the author being translated. As a translator, Professor Sonsi has produced English versions of Chino Castanello and Jean Mopoulos. He has taught at numerous universities around the world and keeps up dialogue with fellow inquirers through journals, book series, and uh, an occasional blog, Print Culture. I've had the chance to read some of his posts in this blog, and in one of them, titled Suspended, published on April 17, Professor Sonsi discusses the fundamental nature of the humanities brought to bear in pandemic times. I quote, the humanities are the arts that teach you how to have a meeting with yourself when even Zoom stops working. And while we are certainly equipped as humanists to have meetings with ourselves, regardless of Zoom, we do hope that Zoom will not stop working now and will give us the pleasure to listen to your presentation. Thank you very much. The floor is yours, Professor Sosson. Thank you so much. It's, it's really a joy to be together with you all, even in this, in this uh, digitally mediated form. Uh, please, if, uh, if you can't hear me or if anything goes wrong, just use the chat function and I will adjust. But so I'll, I'll be reading this paper and maybe adding a few comments on this side. So it's called Air, Freedom and Finitude, Some Paths of Association, as you know, and here it goes. A proverb has it that fish are unaware of water. Has anyone ever asked a fish? Nowadays, we become increasingly conscious of the air we breathe as it becomes increasingly hot and ever more charged with carbon dioxide. In this, we see the unexpected, lamentable collapse of a major imaginative resource. Just a second, I forgot that I had slides for you. So uh, let me get that going on. Uh, 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 let's see. There we are. All right. Loading up the slides, and I'll use the share screen function. Uh, good. Boom, back to Zoom. All right. Uh, let me see if I can make this work. That's what oh, I yeah. want. Yeah. Ah, okay. Good. And <laughs> on the right and left margins, it's okay? You can see everything? Because sometimes people's screens don't accommodate. All right, on we go. For a long time, air stood in the public imagination for both freedom and equality. Air, like the wind of the spirit, according to St. John, bloweth where it listeth. 
Nobody can stop the wind from blowing this way or that. At most, we can raise walls and a roof or wrap ourselves in protective layers to keep out the wind, the rain, and the cold. But by doing so, we have not controlled the air. We have only constructed a, a domain of personality and privacy against the invasions of the air. My house, my body, a restriction of the wind's unquestionable freedom that creates another way of understanding freedom. The air has freedom to move as it will. In covering myself, I claim freedom from its incursions. Leading questions of liberal political philosophy, such as negative and positive liberty, can be exemplified in the simple act of sheltering the vulnerable mortal body. And air stood for equality because it is free in the economic sense, free as in free beer. The beggar and the king are popularly supposed to breathe the same air and to have an equal claim on it. We all breathe the same air, as the saying goes. Uh, that saying, by the way, was pronounced by John F. Kennedy in response to the uh, riots and demonstrations of his time, uh, led largely by Dr. Martin Luther King, right? So we all breathe the same air, has this, this connotation of reducing inequality or aspiring to reduce inequality. But that wonderful saying is not quite true. The people who enjoy the other advantages of life are more likely to have clean air to breathe. Air was free and the same because it was, as far as anyone knew, infinite. And being thus devoid of scarcity, it gave no motive to deny it to anyone. The equality of the air is a charming fiction. We would do better to class it as a regulative idea, one of those things that seem to be true and should be true as we discover that rich and poor do not, despite the proverb, breathe the same air, we also discover that the people of the present do not breathe an air of the same quality that those of the past breathed, and those who come after us will breathe an air that is even worse. We become conscious of the ways that air, previously and proverbially a space of freedom and equality, is crisscrossed with inequalities and asymmetries. Part of the mystique of the air before these acts of reconsideration took place was its power to propose an image of coexistence that was radically different from that which most people encountered in their lives. Air was free, egalitarian, infinite, and as a precondition of those qualities, natural. Whereas human societies were oppressive, hierarchical, constrained, and ungenerous. As if to say that air is free, air is natural, and what is natural is right and good. Therefore, you must admit freedom is good. The suspicion that presently surrounds prescriptive moral claims associated with the idea of nature can perhaps be relieved by the thought that the freedom and equality that have often been championed as natural values can be justified in myriad other ways, among which naturalness is only a shorthand for the desired removal of artificially created, intentional, self-interested restrictions. As the properties of the air increasingly converge with the vices of human societies, I am led to proclaim a tragedy of the imagination. For we need images of difference and potential to lead us away from our present state. When you say, I can't breathe, you are begging to be restored to the condition of someone who can breathe. No one should ever respond, what makes you think you deserve to breathe? Or if someone does, and I suppose some do, that only indicates to what depths human mercy has sunk. Air is natural, breathing is natural. These assumptions power our instinctual urge to relieve the suffering of the person who can't breathe. And air and breathing are also, in addition to being natural, social, and political, like everything in the political realm, they are unequally distributed, though it may scandalize us to hear that fact. 70 years ago, Gaston Bachelard was already divided in his thoughts about air and freedom, as he, as he expresses them in his beautiful meditation on air and the imagination, l'air et les songes. And here's a little quotation from Bachelard where he says, need I point out that in the realm of the imagination, the epithet that clings most closely to the noun air is the adjective free. Natural air is free air. We must then be exceptionally careful 
in handling an inauthentically experienced liberation, a premature ascent to the doctrines of free air, of liberating aerial movement. Bachelard had nothing against the freedom of the air, far from it. What he found unacceptable was the automatic assignment of a moral quality, freedom, to a natural object, as if thinking about air were sufficient to make one free and unlimited. It's the logic of the metaphor, the instantaneity of the linkage, une adhesion trop prompte, that is troublesome. As if, to update matters, it were enough to mention the environment or to have an image of it in order to be doing environmentalism, enough to mention or envision feminism to be doing feminism and so forth, right? At the corporate level, we call this greenwashing. As if the word were tantamount to the deed, as if there were no work required to realize the outcome. Bachelard is here threading a delicate passage between the powers of language to bring things into being and the impotence of language to bring them all the way into being. As people deeply involved with the workings of that special form of human contact that is literature, we are well placed to see the imagination for all it can do and all that it can't by itself do. Thus, if we are gathered here around the topic of eco-culture and literature, a large part of that work will certainly be following ecology as a theme among writers, eco-poetics and eco-criticism as domains of discourse, the ecological sensibilities of poets and novelists who perhaps were never even aware of the environment as a problem. But another part will be thinking about the properties whereby literature, imagination, language, and consciousness are or act as environments. What is it to be an environment? An environment is encompassing, supportive, usually taken for granted, and we come to realize finite. We are in and of our environments long before we ever notice them, if indeed we ever do. It is a relation of dependency. But from the moment that we understand our responsibility for preserving an environment or some valued part of it, the dependency is reversed. A little like the way grown up children find themselves in a parental role regarding their aging parents. From being taken to granted to being the focus of unremitting care, there is quite a transition. And the pivotal moment, it seems to me, is one of consciousness where the environment becomes a finite, mortal, somehow individual thing. Literature, whether you think of it as a mimesis of reality or as the bodying forth of as yet unrealized non-realities, has a stake in this individuation of the previously indefinable. In literary texts, we see how names and narratives get attached to aspects of the world that would otherwise be invisible because they were unconditional. And with a long enough literary record, we can see the steps of the process. Scientists, or as they used to call them, natural philosophers, moralists, poets, historians, geographers, ethnographers, all contribute to the common task of discovering how we live in the world. At this point, it might seem that we are embarked on an adventure that is basically narrative in character, a retrospective history of the things humans have said to each other about aspects of the environment over the several millennia for which we have written documentation. I wish I could go into the Chinese written documentation on this issue, but that would take us very far afield. I hesitate, however, to commit so strongly to a history relying on expressed opinions. Humans had been breathing the atmosphere for tens of thousands of years before they seemed to have noticed it. And even when they did notice it, it remained a specialist concern. There are readily imaginable cognitive reasons for this. Air is all enveloping, multidimensional, invisible, quasi limitless. It is the precondition for everything we do and are. It has no discernible beginning or end. How to narrate something like an atmosphere? The omnipresence of the atmosphere is indeed comparable to the role of language. We are aware of language when we use it to do some concrete, determinate thing. But we're unaware of all the features of language, even our own language, that we are not using at the moment. You can live your whole life uttering and responding to acts of parole and never stop to ask about langue, 
if I may invoke Ferdinand de Saussure's distinction. Language is our milieu, our cognitive atmosphere. How do we ever become conscious of it? It is the same story in both cases. People became conscious of their language when something broke down. Rhetorical language, and poetic language too, deals with words breaking under the pressure that is being applied to them. Achilles is a lion, says the poet, but he's not a lion. There is no possible way for someone to be simultaneously a four-footed feline with sharp teeth and a man wearing armor and carrying a spear. So the science of rhetoric, the earliest form of semantics and linguistics, emerges to account for these improper uses of language. Similarly, we begin to understand the features of our own language when we discover how those features do not correspond to those of another language. When something fails to make sense when translated directly, we don't give up on translation in general. We simply call it an idiom specific to English or whatever language it is. The strangeness of the grammatical rules of foreign languages reveals to us the rules of our own. Through language contact, my language is no longer just language, the reflection of the way things are. I have been learning English ever since I started to learn French. In fact, I've been learning English ever since I moved to the North because the, the language I grew up with is not identical to the language spoken around me here. And when the atmosphere varies in unexpected ways, when it fills with smoke after a volcanic explosion, or it becomes thin and cold on a mountaintop, or as we have come to know, when it gets heavy with carbon and begins to retain a greater share of the heat transmitted from the sun, we begin to know it differently. Let's pull out the Greek dictionary and check the word atmos, the first half of our modern word atmosphere. It does not mean the air, the natural clear air at all. Rather, the Greeks gave it a name only under certain circumstances, which the dictionary defines as steam vapor, vapor of incense, in plural, vapors, clouds of steam, especially of odors, distinguished from atmis as dry from moist by Olympiodorus in his commentary on Aristotle's Meteora, says the definition, with a string of quotations from Aeschylus, Aristotle, and other authorities. Steam, vapor, smoke, incense, mm. odor, air with an extra added something air with coloration and a kind of embodiment that makes us notice it. Atmos can take many forms, but is apparently other than the usual, natural, given, transparent air. Only when the air is marked, as the linguists say, does it have a name. Such accidental observed events, smoke, clouds, steam, smells, climate change, affect us similarly to those linguistic events we call tropes or changes of meaning. A trope is a shift of attention. The person who says, I can't breathe, or let's translate it into less subjective terms, breathing is not now possible for me, is more attentive to breathing than anyone else on earth at that moment. We all need to breathe, but it comes to mind only rarely and when it fails. In that, breathing and meaning are akin. By the way, for the art historians, I'd like to add a reference to a book that, uh, that I forgot about while I was writing this. It's Hubert Damisch's wonderful book about the painting of the air and the atmosphere in 17th century, uh, largely Dutch art. Uh, interesting because it uh, predates the, uh, the scientific handling of the atmosphere. So, you know, you always have to jump on these occasions when the artists are ahead of the scientists in notice, noticing that something's interesting. They may not have the explanation for it, but they're looking at it. So although it would be fascinating to tell the story of humans' consciousness of their environment, more narrowly of their relation to the atmosphere through the history of ideas, listing what the Vedas say, what Aristotle said, what Al-Farabi said, and so on, I think such a method would be insufficiently atmospheric it would turn ideas into objects. It would be too good at doing precisely those things that are not part of the way of being of an elemental, necessary, transcendental aspect of the world. It would notice only the smoke, not the air on which the fire feeds. 
how did the atmosphere become, and I quote David Valentine, a doubled figure as both breathable gases and his metaphor for context? My method, my thread for working this out is to observe innovations in language. The creation of a new word is self-evidently an event in the history of a speech community's relationship with the field of reference that it describes. But changes in the meaning of a word are hardly less powerful indicators. The ways that words can be made to change their meaning are familiar to everyone who has opened up a manual of rhetoric. Metaphor, metonymy, synecdoche, personification, meiosis, hyperbole, and all the other tropes and figures are quite handy labels for describing semantic change, especially when we see it happening as a textual innovation at a particular moment of time. It's a little too good to be true that the lower part of the atmosphere, the level where most weather phenomena take place, is known as the troposphere, you know, the sphere of tropes. So the air, the atmosphere, the ambience are so pervasive that they fail to be accounted for until a lack makes itself felt, mm -hmm. as it has in recent years. And a lack, as you'll remember from, from Vladimir Propp's studies of the folktale, is the first step in constructing a narrative. I am, in other words, paying attention here to effortful writing about the air. The linguistic effects connoted by the atmosphere derive, as it happens, from the effort made in language to overcome a lack and to give tangible form to the intangible, to that which is all around us and presupposed by every breath we take. Literary history shows this happening repeatedly and in patterned significant ways. The atmosphere, says Craig Martin, itself might seem like a given, a universally recognized phenomenon that transcends eras and cultures. Yet the word appeared at a particular moment before 1600, no one used the word or in fact thought about the atmosphere. Innovation is built into the word Coined around 1608 by a Dutch polymath named Snellius, it was a new word for a newly noticed thing. But the newness, the newness of a word does not keep it off the rhetorical merry-go-round for long. Now, being a comparatist, I am embarrassed by the vast range of choices before me. What language, what period, what genre, what geographical area shall I start with? Are not all of them equally relevant? whether or not I can understand them. I hope you will allow me to ignore 99% of the possible exhibits and turn to the evidence of, offered by the history of the French language. There's some practical reasons for this. When I looked into atmosphere, ambiance, air, and other words in English, I found that their forms and meanings were usually taken from French. There were, you know, the French would invent a usage and 20 or 30 years later, people would adopt it in English. So if you wanted to understand the process of innovation, there would really be no point in using the English dictionaries and, uh, and databases, better to go to French. So let's reconstruct the career of this word. We have some deliciously archaic French in front of us. Here's Marin Mersenne, the good friend of Descartes in 1634. He's talking about some of the problems that science in his time was beginning to raise and not quite solved yet. Il faut encore remarquer que l'on ne sait pas si tout l'espace qui est depuis le sommet de notre atmosphère jusqu'à la Lune est vide, ou s'il est rempli d'un air ou d'un éther très subtil. Right? You know, what, what happens when you get out of the Earth's atmosphere and go towards the Moon? Is it empty? Is there an ether? Is there is there air? Right. Uh, Cyrano de Bergerac at about this same time was writing a fantasy novel about traveling to the moon in which breathing was absolutely not a problem. So he had already resolved this imaginatively, although I think rather lazily. Already then in, in Mersenne, the imagination is differentiating between atmosphere and air and tracing limits to our atmosphere. Now Mersenne, has been reading Galileo and Gassendi and others who have pointed out that the Earth's atmosphere is not perfectly transparent. It is a reflecting and deforming medium of light. 
So there's something about the atmosphere that we can know and measure. It's not invisible. It's not identical with the mysterious vastness of space. So the air is becoming marked, just as atmos was marked in Greek. There is a whole series of experiments carried on through the uh, early 17th century that give atmosphere its tangibility. There's Edmund Mariotte, who, oops, sorry, leaping ahead here. Edmund Mariotte describes how barometers can show different weights and pressures of the air at different alt altitudes. So air uh, obeys different conditions. It has a substance, and this means retracting some of the proverbial freedom of the air because scientists discover that it is not universally the same. Its properties change according to circumstances that we can manipulate. And so there's Torricelli, then there's Gassendi, uh, and Torricelli is performing experiments on air and vacuum and pressure that uh, lead towards an Epicurean doctrine, right? Atomism, which the church, by the way, was very worried about because atomism is atheistic and it introduces a great deal of randomness in, in the universe rather than spiritual teleology. Um, and this whole language of atoms in the air uh, is, uh, is, a bit, is a bit ticklish, especially when somebody like Gassendi adopts it. Gassendi, who was the opponent of Descartes on the question of whether the body and soul are distinct. And his, his way of talking about the soul and the body belonging to the same thing constantly invokes the metaphor of liquids and fluids and gases, right? These things that are kind of in between. So I add that just to sort of give a, give a sense of the intellectual context and what is at stake in even raising the topic of the air. So uh, Francois Bernier, who's a disciple of Gassendi, has a very interesting career. He spends time in Persia and other places, and very unfortunately for world history, invents the theory of race as based on skin color. Uh, nonetheless, this uh, uh, Francois Bernier writes a book in which he's just summarizing for French readers the philosophy of Gassendi. And he comes up with some, with some analogies for air, right? Air is an exhalation that emerges from soil and water, and it surrounds the globe like a layer of down, you know, as if the globe were, say, an, a newborn chick with down on it, or like fine cotton around a quince, right? If you, if you have an orchard and valuable fruits are there, you don't want the wasps to be uh, messing up the fruit, so you put a little kind of sock of fine cotton around it so that it will, it will be protected, right? These are the analogies that he uses for atmosphere in relation to the earth, right? Uh, and his, uh, the main word that he uses, textura, is taken from Lucretius, right? Atomism again. So there was this agenda to the materialization of air. It was partly a kind of tacit atomism uh, and chiefly, it was the expansion of the powers of physical science to explain everything in the world. Not just clouds, wind, and rain, but also ultimately the behavior of nations and individuals and the thoughts that circulate in our brains. From being a non-thing, air became ever more a thing under the prying eyes of natural scientists. And experiments with the vacuum pump even proved that parts of the world could be emptied of air, which was theologically problematic because if there's a part of the world that has no, no substance in it at all, uh, it seems to almost concede that there could be a part of the, the universe in which God is not present. Very worrisome idea. After Bernier's paraphrase of Gassendi, using a word that Gassendi never used in print, atmosphere, the trésor de la langue française, which is sort of the French equivalent of the Oxford English Dictionary, the historical dictionary, uh, catalogs dozens of occurrences of the word from the later 17th and early 18th centuries. I'm very grateful to the uh, digital version of this trésor, which, which you can search and which has hundreds and hundreds of texts, nicely dated, although not perfectly edited. Most of these occurrences of atmosphere are taken from Voltaire's presentation of Newton's ideas. The notion of the atmosphere was such 
a, uh, an international symbol of intellectual progress at the time when Diderot and D'Alembert were writing their Encyclopédie, that one of the first articles that they wrote and circulated as a kind of a sample so that people would see what it was and would invest in it uh, was the article on atmosphere, which they excerpted from Ephraim Chambers' English Cyclopedia of 1728, but updated it to reflect the latest research of the 1740s. So the word atmosphere between Chambers and the Encyclopédie becomes almost a slogan of the Enlightenment, an example that demonstrates the success of rational inquiry into all things visible and invisible. And yet, there's not a lot of linguistic invention to report in the first few decades of the use of the word atmosphere. There is some extension of the domain of the word uh, that uh, brings it into connection with human senses, with the human sensibility in this passage from Diderot's Lettre sur les aveugles, uh, a wonderful text of science and philosophical speculation and moral speculation. Uh, it should be considered maybe the founding text of disability studies in the Western world. Uh, this beautiful Lettre sur les aveugles that was circulated all over Europe includes a moment where he's describing a blind, a blind man whom he knows in a suburb of Paris who is so sensitive to the slightest changes that can occur in the atmosphere that he can tell the difference between a street and a dead-end alley, right? Because of hearing and feeling the way that the air sits around his body, right? So here's a connection between atmosphere and human sensibility. So, but, you know, this is still within the realm of natural science. Uh, but now it's time for uh, writers to begin exploring the possible figures of speech that can be spun out of atmosphere. Julien Offray de la Maîtrie, who's remembered for his materialistic account of body and soul, L'Homme Machine of 1747, a book, by the way, that was quickly uh, burned and destroyed. Uh, it was quite a scandal. It was too materialistic for the time. Uh, so the author of this book, La Maîtrie, observes that the mind is always agitated by many thoughts that come and go. And as a consequence, puisqu'il lui est impossible d'assigner un seul objet auquel l'âme est prêtée quelque attention, parmi cette foule innombrable d'idées confuses qui, comme autant de nuages, remplissent, pour ainsi dire, l'atmosphère de notre cerveau. A wonderful passage that shows the extension of atmosphere to the realm of figures, right? The atmosphere of our brain. Uh, I think here there's a little attack on Cartesianism, which required us to have clear and distinct ideas that we could think about, otherwise we're not really reasoning. Uh, but Maitri is going to be descriptive. He says, well, actually, what happens in our brain is like this. It's like clouds that are floating around, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, La Maîtrie is definitely more accurate in depicting what happens with my mind than uh, Descartes with his geometric bias. So this phrase, the atmosphere of our brains, makes an astonishing condensation of the properties of the air, its ubiquity, its mutability, its backgroundedness, with the properties of the mind when it is not concentrating on anything in particular. And in L'Art de Jouir of 1751, he asks about the pleasure lovers have in being in each other's company. Quel plaisir, grand Dieu, que ce de l'amour! Est-ce la volupté même qui plane dans son atmosphère? Right, kind of a specific application of this idea of the atmosphere of our brain. If you're in love, you, you have the thought of the beloved always floating around in your mind. Right, so here, this is the beginning, you could say, of affect studies, right? Atmosphere is a shorthand for affect. The noteworthy thing is how unnoteworthy such uses are for us, because we've heard atmosphere being used in this way thousands of times. If, if you want to tell me about a nightclub you've just discovered, you'll probably tell me what sort of atmosphere it has, right? What is it? Is it punk? Is it post-punk? Is it retro, post-punk? Whatever, right? Uh, this is a, an acquired meaning for, the meaning for the word that is so familiar that it counts as a dead metaphor. 
no one bothers to think about barometric atmosphere pressure or the optics of sunlight when somebody says, I'm working in a place that has a terrible atmosphere. This figurative meaning has become invisible. It's a background condition in English, French, I would assume also in Portuguese and other languages, just as the atmosphere usually is. Even in Chinese today, we can speak of the qi fen of a place, of a person, of an event, of a nightclub. But La Maitrie is using atmosphere in this emotional associative sense for the first time ever, so far as I can determine. The condition of imageless banality that belongs with the word today had to be achieved by frequent dulling repetition. So, you know, I want to pull out La Maitrie from history and, and uh, give him a medal for inventing something new, the atmosphere of atmosphere itself. So, okay, this is, in a way, this is very familiar, right? Uh, everyone who talks about figurative language knows that one thing figurative language does is give a tangible material uh, analogy to something that is invisible or abstract, right? Think about the ways that we talk about time, right? We say that something happens before or after another thing, right? Using space, which is familiar to us, which we can speak about analytically, in order to get a grasp on time, which is much harder to grasp. In fact, by using the word grasp, I'm doing exactly the same thing, using a kind of a foundational metaphor that physicalizes an abstract thing, right? This is something that's terribly well known, and so you might expect it, right? Once the nat natural atmosphere has been discovered and named and described, Naturally, then you would expect the social atmosphere and the imaginary atmosphere to follow. But there are a couple of things that catch my attention about this. One is the rarity of occurrences. You have hundreds of occurrences of atmosphere in the natural science sense before you have the very first occurrence of the figurative sense, the sense of an atmosphere of feeling. And when atmosphere of feeling occurs, it's represented in the work of a very marginal thinker whose works were condemned and burned, who, uh, who had to leave France and uh, take refuge in Prussia, where Frederick the Great was a little bit more tolerant of philosophe, and whose works didn't circulate that much, or if they did, it was kind of sous le manteau, under the table. You might contrast Voltaire, who had a whole publishing industry that belonged to himself. He, he was uh, one of the great publicists of the age. You know, every time he wrote a letter, people would know about it all across Europe. And Voltaire then, who is very attentive to atmosphere, never crosses this invisible barrier between sense perception and affect that La Maitrie does cross. So, you know, this, this application of atmosphere to non-physical things is actually unusual and kind of risky. It's not at all something that had to happen. What gave it more staying power was a new perception of danger and contagion. And there, I think, is the analogy with our present time that we're worried about the fate of the atmosphere. In the 18th century, the atmosphere became moralized because it was noticed as a problem, a problem that needed to be fixed. So Chambers talks about how the atmosphere is responsible for all the processes of generation, corruption, and dissolution in the natural world. Voltaire was thinking about contagion, also one of these early discoveries of the 18th century. And he talks about uh, hospitals where the, you have four or five sick people in each bed. And one guy uh, gives scurvy to his neighbor and gets smallpox in return. And a plague-ridden atmosphere scatters incurable diseases and death everywhere. Well, I think we have to give him 50% because you can get smallpox from your neighbor. Scurvy is a nutritional deficiency and you can't get it from your neighbor, right? But, you know, he's doing the best he can for 1752. So contagion and death are assigned to the atmosphere and action is required. Right? Move out of the cities, says Voltaire. Open the windows. Put people in different beds. Il est certain, says Voltaire, que le sol et l'atmosphère signalent leur empire sur toutes les productions de la nature, à commencer par l'homme et à finir par les champignons. OK? 
Okay, he's having some fun here because I think conventionally you would want to begin with mushrooms and build up to man, but he's, he's sort of taking our arrogance down a peg. All right, so the atmosphere is responsible for everything. This though, <clears throat> this idea uh, has some political uh, consequences because uh, people like Montesquieu at the time are also explaining the different political systems of the world by climate determinism, right? It's because in Persia, you have a lot of dry areas and not much water and almost no forest. That's why they have a despotic government and, you know, this sort of thing, right? As contrasted with Europe where you have rain and forests and there you have limited monarchy, right? This kind of thing is a reflex of thinking in which background conditions explain the objects that we habitually foreground, right? Normally we would say, uh, you know, Europe, Europeans behave in certain ways because of their culture or because of their kings or because of their values and Persians boy, and behave in different ways because of that. And Montesquieu is radically reducing the possibilities to what the climate enables, right? So, that's a, um, that's a reflex of thinking that uh, some people adopt, other people resist in the 18th century. Uh, and one of the consequences is the use of atmosphere in this deterministic sense to, uh, to promote a political program of reform. Mirabeau, about 30 years beca before becoming an important political figure in the French Revolution, uh, writes that the atmosphere can be poisoned by decadence and tyranny. Uh, here's uh, a work of uh, basically economics and demography called L'Ami des Hommes, uh, where he's talking about uh, not only overpopulation, but you know, the, the imbalance between cities and countryside and so on, you know, the sort of thing that uh, that uh, people in this era were interested in, which Michel Foucault has beautifully uh, analyzed in his works on governmentality. So Mirabeau is complaining about spending. Well, as you know, people in, people in Paris in 1752, they really knew how to spend money. They spent it on coiffure, they spent it on interior decoration, they spent it on clothes, coaches, theaters, all that kind of thing. And Mirabeau here is sounding the note of a moralist. And he says, you know, that this mad spending, excessive expenditure, produces fruits that are so monstrous and strange that the whole atmosphere is poisoned by them. Right? So he's urging people to spend less money, to be more, uh, more, um, more conservative in the old sense of the word. Elvisius strikes a similar note. He says that la mollesse, which was also the target of Mirabeau, right? Too much spending makes you soft, says Mirabeau. And Helvetius picks it up and says, la mollesse commande à presque tous ceux qui naissent armés du pouvoir arbitraire, you know, pointing rather directly at people in Versailles. L'atmosphère répandue autour des trônes despotiques et des souverains qui s'y asseyent semble remplie d'une vapeur léthargique qui saisit toutes leurs, les facultés de leur âme. Right? So that atmosphere of despotism poisons everybody and makes them go to sleep. Simon Linguet in Théorie des lois civiles uh, protests that prisons are bad atmospheres full of the odor of crime right? and they act on the minds of those who are imprisoned. So a bunch of, at of atmospheres now uh, are provided in these texts uh, with an ethical overtone. And the reader is propelled toward the conclusion that reforms will be necessary, right? We've got to change the prisons. We've got to change the way that the sovereigns are behaving. We have to change the economy in order to change the atmosphere. But by saying atmosphere, you're also saying that the reforms will have to be all pervading and all enveloping because that's the kind of thing that an atmosphere is. Nothing less than total reform will do. Now, I want to be a little bit suspicious of our inclination toward teleological thinking because when we read these texts from the 1750s and 60s, we're hearing in them an anticipation of the French Revolution. That wasn't exactly predictable, right? 
these are all utterances of philosophes who are trying to reform the world. And as we know from the example of Voltaire, they were not democratic. Voltaire counted on enlightened sovereigns to create top-down laws that would change the nature of society. And so did many of these people. Nonetheless, even though we can't count on some kind of inevitability in history to take this word atmosphere all the way to 1789, it does provide an agenda for very ambitious, totalizing revolutionary demands. So from these examples, we see the atmosphere as a medium of power. It stands for both the unmerited power of the despot that drugs everyone around him and the presumably justified power of reform that we're waiting for. Atmosphere is all pervasive, all power, powerful and invisible. It's nonetheless material and tangible and in the right hands it is malleable. Both metaphor and hyperbole, La Maitre's unprecedentedly strong figure of speech that is indirectly relayed by Mirabeau and Linguet is an allegory of condition in general, of the ways that the places where people meet and act shape all possible action. Voltaire, Mirabeau, and Helvetius denounce the poisonous lethargic atmospheres guaranteed, uh, generated by despotism, best found in prisons where people have the least freedom to choose their atmosphere, and they show the necessity of doing the near impossible, changing the atmosphere. This is a kind of a retort to Montesquieu. That is, they use atmosphere in La Maitre's sense against atmosphere in the physical sense. So I think this word history can stop here because I wanted to hold it to one frame of reference, that of a hierarchical property-based society in which intellectuals and writers had some freedom and notoriety. Some of these enlightened people like Diderot and Voltaire who took an interest in physical science were alert to the shaping powers of language. Over slightly more than a hundred years, they wove into being the atmosphere as a commonly recognized scientific construct that had metaphorical implications for the diagnosis of ills in human society. I would designate the activity of users of this word, implicitly defining and redefining it in practice as what David Valentine in a wonderful essay about uh, perspectives on earth from space calls an emergent and shifting contextualization process, producing newly interested attachments across terrestrial nature culture divides and creating new possible causalities for others to follow up on. In Ancien Régime France, intellectuals held little, if any, direct power. Diderot could be jailed on the mere say-so of an aristocrat with connections. Voltaire had to move to Switzerland. But those philosophes had in the highest degree the power to shape representations and influence the interpretation of events through the use of language and imagination. This power I see as being rhetorically bodied forth in the figures of speech that make the atmosphere a social or moral medium, a vehicle for conveying attitudes and influencing feelings. The metaphorical atmosphere was of course weak, but evocations of it called for a future moment when having been adopted as the agenda of reform, it would be strong. Jumping over many wars, revolutions, and other transformations of the social world, we too find ourselves looking at the atmosphere. We are conscious of it because we constantly see signs of it changing. We fear that it has become poisoned, and we see that the only way to forestall that outcome is to reform, brutally, the whole taken-for-granted way of doing things in industrial societies. In other words, to change the social atmosphere and thereby to have a chance of restoring the physical atmosphere to a condition harmonious with the continued existence of beings like ourselves. Everyone remembers the sentence from Marx's notes on Feuerbach. Philosophers have hitherto interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. But, but I think Marx was too hasty or too impatient. His way of framing things puts the academic at odds with the activist. To interpret the world is already to change it in some measure since words and rep representations make up so great a part of the human life world. 
In the career of practically any word, such as atmosphere, for example, you can see how interpreting morphs into changing and back again. The material history of language and literature that interests me is inclusive. It doesn't drive a wedge between interpreting and changing, between thoughts and realities, between language and history. I submit to your consideration the thought that an inclusive model like this one stands the best chance of linking the humanities with the social and natural sciences in similarity of purpose, not in antithesis, and so of responding to the crises that traverse our present atmosphere. Thank you.